Welcome to the first of our F3 lectures. Don't forget you can download all of our mind maps for free from the website. So the key word here is strategy. We're really thinking at quite a high level in the organization when we're thinking about the financial strategy of that organization. So we're thinking at a director level, the board. So if we are charged with financial management within an organization, if we are setting the financial strategy, what does that encompass? Well, it encompasses planning three different areas and it's really important for this course that you understand the linkage between these three areas, that you're able to discuss them and that you're able to recognise the importance of not only each of the areas individually, but how those different areas work together and how they're all interlinked to be of importance to the finance manager who sets the financial strategy for the organization. So we're planning, first of all, investments. Now we'll go ahead in the rest of this course to look in detail at how uh, certain investments will be decided upon, how we decide which investments we should undertake and which investments we shouldn't. So those investments may be short-term investments. It may be, for example, that the business has too much cash at a certain point in time and needs to invest that cash. It may invest that cash in shares or bonds or something that will generate a return for the business. Or it may be a long-term investment. Now, long-term investments may well make up the a uh, short-term investment we've already talked about, i.e. maybe shares, bonds. But really, when we look at this in more detail, we will be thinking about long-term projects such as new products or mergers and acquisitions. And those are the areas that we will be concentrating on when we look at those long-term investments. So the first thing to plan when setting the financial strategy of the business is investments. The second thing is financing. We can't make investments if we don't have the financing available within the business. And we'll talk in detail later on in this course about uh, equity financing, for example, raising shares, raising capital through issuing shares. We'll also talk about raising capital through debt, through bond issues. Not only that, but we could go to the bank and get a loan from them. Or indeed, we could manage our working capital more efficiently to try to free up some financing for the business. All of those areas we will look at, all of those areas are part of financial strategy. So it may be bonds or equity that we raise to try and get capital to finance our investments. Now, the link that you need to recognise between the two is that we can't make those investments unless we have that financing available. So we'll look at the different criteria that a business will have before they decide upon whether to use bonds or equity to raise capital. The last area to link in here is dividend policy, which we will look at later on in this lecture. Dividend policy is how to use the profit from those investments and how much of it we should distribute to the shareholders. So dividend policy is crucially important for the financial strategy of the business because we need to decide how much we should distribute and how much needs to be kept within the business, perhaps for investment in those other projects that we've identified. So we need to see the linkage again between the dividend policy, investments and financing. We can't pay dividends if we don't have successful investments. We can't have successful investments unless we have the financing there available to us to make those investments. Also, with our dividend policy, we can't maybe finance those investments if we pay too high a dividend. We need to retain some of those dividends in the business to reinvest rather than paying them out to shareholders. And that is a playoff that the uh, strategy setters will need to make and that we'll look at later on in this lecture. 
So some other areas that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about the financial strategy of a business, at what level do we set the strategy? Well, the corporate strategy will be set at a high level, at board level. And this decides things such as, should we enter new markets? Should we perhaps stick to our current markets and try to do better in those markets? New products, setting the strategy at a high level is referred to as setting the corporate strategy. As opposed to setting the business strategy, we're thinking here at a business unit level. So maybe we have a conglomerate that at a corporate level has a certain strategy. Well, we need to set the strategy for each business unit to try to achieve that overall corporate strategy. So business strategy is generally set at a slightly lower level to director level. So we're thinking here about improving the competitive position of the firm. And at an operational level, well, we can't implement any strategy, be it business or corporate, if we don't have good operational controls and have a strong operational strategy to ensure that we get things right at that level. So we're really thinking here about the functional areas of the business. How do we apply the strategy that we've set at the higher level? So that could be finance units, it could be functional areas, but it's at a lower level than both corporate and business strategy. From the point of view of the exam, a question in this area is likely to focus on corporate strategy. We're thinking at a higher level now, but do be aware of how decisions made at that corporate level will affect both the business strategy and the operational strategy of the business. And we need to be able to implement that corporate strategy through our operational units. Also do be aware that we'll need to uh, make sure that this fits in with the three core aspects that we've talked about our investments, our financing and our dividend policy. In addition to that, we'll need to consider stakeholders within the business, particularly again, if you're looking at an exam standard question that's asking us to assess the current strategy of a firm or indeed to suggest a strategy. And this, any strategy that we set or suggest should fit in with what we know about current stakeholders. Now, stakeholders, we will think of as being anyone who has a legitimate interest in the business. So the key words there being a legitimate interest. There may be people or bodies who are interested in the business, but they may not have a legitimate interest and therefore be stakeholders who we have to consider when making decisions. So stakeholders, we could separate out into internal stakeholders and that would cover such people as the managers of the organisation and the employees of the organisation. So our strategy would be set with the goals of those internal stakeholders in mind. Managers and employees will both be seeking to retain their employment. They both want the business to be successful because in that instance they still have a job. At a higher level, managers will become interested in pay and benefits and bonuses. So that can be quite short term and we need to bear that in mind when we're setting the strategy for the firm. We could also consider the needs of external stakeholders. That would be those such as investors. Well, we'll definitely consider those needs. Uh, the community at large, if they have a vested interest. Banks, who perhaps have lent us money and financing. The government, because the government will always have an interest in the business continuing to pay its taxes, being successful and not having an adverse impact on society as a whole. Customers will also be included in those external stakeholders as will suppliers. So all of these need to be considered when we're setting that strategy for the firm. And we remember are particularly interested here in the financial strategy of the firm. Now, there are some problems when it comes to that because there are often conflicting objectives between our different stakeholders. One of the key problems here is called the agency problem. So the agency problem is part of the relationship between the managers 
and the shareholders within a business. Remember, the managers will be charged by the shareholders to look after their investment. The shareholders own the business, the managers run the business on their behalf. So we have the shareholders and we have management. However, the goals of these two stakeholders are not the same. Shareholders, well, they want a stable, long-term investment. They will want a return, but preserving the capital that they have invested in the business will be their primary objective. So they want a long-term, stable investment. Management, on the other hand, well, they want a return. They want money and they want it now. They want good pay, they want bonuses and they want to better themselves. Those are not the same as the long-term objectives of the shareholders. Management have short-term objectives, shareholders have long-term objectives. And that is a problem because management may not therefore act in the long-term interests of the firm. So any question that you answer in this exam must be framed with that in mind. We must consider what the goals are of management and how they conflict or potentially conflict with the shareholders. And we need to try to achieve goal congruence to bring the goals of these two parties together. And we could do that perhaps by giving management shares or share options or deferred shares in return for their work within the firm. Because remember, the directors and the managers within the business will be getting performance related pay. So in return for their performance, we can give them something that aligns their goals with those of the shareholders, as we've said, such as share options or deferred shares that they get if the business runs smoothly in the longer term. Also, when we're thinking about uh, conflicting objectives, we may be uh, in a position where the business is at odds with the community at large. So, for example, the BP oil disaster in the Mexican Gulf. BP were accused of putting profit before the community and the impact that the oil disaster had on that local community meant that BP was severely damaged through it. So those sorts of objectives need to be considered when we're setting the strategy within the organisation. So let's think now about what those financial objectives that we'll set whenever we're setting the financial strategy of the firm will be. So financial objectives, remember, we'll need to bear in mind our stakeholders and other objectives. But if we're thinking purely financial, our three key objectives will be this. Number one, maximization of shareholder wealth. And this is absolutely crucial. This comes up on almost every exam. So you need to be able to calculate this. The shareholders, remember, are the owners of the business. We want to maximize their wealth because we, as the financial managers, are there in order to work for those shareholders to give them the best investment that they can. So to calculate our shareholder wealth, we'll take the share price growth plus the dividends paid. And that will give us how much the shareholder wealth has gone up in a certain period or over a year. So let's look at how we would do that in illustration one. So have a look at it. If you've seen this before, perhaps have a go at the question and then work through the answer with me. In illustration one, we're asked to calculate the increase in shareholder wealth uh, per share as a percentage and the total shareholder return. Now this is core syllabus knowledge. You must be able to do these calculations. They're assumed, they're, you don't, you're not given very much time to do them in the exam because it's something they expect that you have done many times. So make sure that you get used to doing this calculation. So the information that we're given is the share price and the dividend paid. Remember, our shareholder wealth is calculated as the increase in that share price plus the dividend paid. So in 2007, we had a share price of $3.30 and we had a dividend paid of 40 cents. Moving on to 2008, we had a share price of $3.56. 
So we can see that the share price has increased it's increased from $3.30 to $3.56. So that means that our share price growth has been 26 cents in that year. In addition to that, we've had a dividend paid of 42 cents. So we can say that the increase in shareholder wealth per share was 68 cents. The 26 cents in share price growth between 07 and 08 plus the 42 cents of dividend paid. So that's 68 cents. Now, if we're asked for that as a percentage, we need to think to ourselves, what would we need to invest to get that 68 cents of a return? And we would have need to invested at the $3.30 share price in 07. So as a percentage, we're going to say, well, if we'd invested at $3.30, and we'd made a return of 68 cents based on that, what percentage is that? Well, 68 cents over the $3.30 is a 20.6% return. So do remember always to use the previous year's share price and take your increase in shareholder wealth per share over that previous year's share price. Now to get the total shareholder return, well, we know we've got 2 million shares. The return per share was 68 cents. So 2 million times 68 cents is 1.36 million. So if you haven't had a go at the rest of this question, pause the video now and do the rest of it in the same way that we've done that. And we'll now work through it together. So in 09, the share price was $3.47, giving us share price growth from 08 to 09 of 9 cents, except this time it was a decrease because the share price in 08 was $3.56. The share price in 09 was $3.47. So it's been a decrease in the share price. However, we still got a dividend paid of 44 cents which gives us an increase in shareholder wealth overall of 35 cents. So 35 cents, to get that return of 35 cents, we would need to have invested at the share price of $3.56. So three, 35 cents over 356 cents or $3.56 is 9.8% of a return. 2 million shares times our 35 cents is 0.7 million total shareholder return. And then in 10, we had a share price of $3.75. This time again, the share price has gone up. So we have an increase in the share price of 28 cents, a dividend paid of 46 cents. Add the two together, we get an increase in shareholder wealth per share of 74 cents. To get that, we would need to have invested at a share price of $3.47. So 74 over the 3.47 is 21.3% of a return. Total shareholder return is to multiply the per share amount by 2 million for the number of shares. So 74 cents times 2 million, 1.48 million. Lastly then, 2011, we had a share price of 3.99. That's an increase in the share price of 24 cents, plus the dividend paid of 48 cents gives us 72 cents. As a percentage, we would need to have invested at $3.75 to get all of that return. So that was 72 over the $3.75, 19.2%. And again, multiplying the 72 cents by 2 million gives us 1.44 million as the total shareholder return. So make sure you can do all of the calculations in this and that whether it asks you for the increase in shareholder wealth or to give it in percentage terms or the total shareholder return, you will be able to deal with it and that you know the difference between each of those. So maximization of shareholder wealth is our number one overriding financial objective above all else. And I want you to keep that in mind throughout this course, 
That is the objective of your financial strategy, to maximise shareholder wealth. To do that, well, we'll need to maximise profit, but we also need to be aware that profit can be manipulated. Remember, accounting profit is based on our accruals basis, and if we're looking at it, it's historic. So maximisation of profit can be manipulated. So maximisation of shareholder wealth is our guide. And thirdly, we have earnings per share growth. Now, profit is earnings. So maximisation of profit and earnings per share growth are really the same thing. But we want to make sure that we get enough marks in the exam to pass. So we'll split it up and we'll show how profit has grown. We'll show how earnings per share has grown. And let's remind ourselves how to calculate earnings per share. It's profit after tax less preference dividends, i.e. distributable profit, over the number of ordinary shares. So that's how we calculate earnings per share. Let's make sure we can do that with illustration two. In illustration two, we're looking at the earnings per share. Make sure that you've attempted this illustration before you work through it with me here. And we simply have, first of all, two years, 2010, 2011, and we're calculating the earnings per share. So profit after tax in 2010 was 1500, and in 2011, 1400, and these are in thousands. The preference dividend, 300 and 400. Remember, we're going to use the profit after tax less the preference dividend. That's distributable profit. So that gives us 1,200 and 1,000. For the number of shares, we have 5,000 of share capital. They're 50 cent shares. So that's 10,000 shares in each of those years. So our earnings per share is our earnings over the number of ordinary shares. So 10,000 is the number of shares. We have 1,200 in 2010. So 1,200 over 10,000 is 12 cents. In 2011, 1,000 was our earnings over 10,000 ordinary shares is 10 cents. So again, very simple and straightforward, but make sure you remember how to calculate your earnings per share. So now we know, number one, the three things we need to plan as a finance manager or when we're setting the financial strategy of a firm. We know that we have our investments, our financing and our dividend policy to set and we know how they're linked. We also know that our objectives are to maximise shareholder wealth, number one, to maximise profit and to increase our earnings per share, to grow our earnings per share. That's because that's a key ratio. All investors will be interested in earnings per share, so they'll all want to see it growing. And remember also that when we're doing that, we have to consider our stakeholders. Also then we'll think about non-financial objectives. Now this will be specific to the scenario that you're given in the question. So it may be any of the following. It could be simply growth of the firm. It could be growth in research and development or being a market leader in research and development. It could be service, improving the service or being again a market leader in service provision. Or it could be quality. All of those are adequate non-financial objectives. If you're looking at an exam question, you need to think about the information that you're given and think, what are the non-financial objectives? Do, do the suggestions that I'm making for this business fit in with those non-financial objectives? For example, uh, cutting costs, uh, scrapping uh, service employees. Well, that's not going to fit in with improving service or indeed being a market leader in quality of service. So when you're making suggestions in the exam, make sure that they fit in with non-financial objectives that you'll see in the scenario. I want to talk now about dividend policy. We said that this is one of the key things that management will need to plan to set their financial strategy. And this is a core aspect of this 
a syllabus. You need to be able to discuss dividend policy and you need to be able to apply that discussion to a scenario that you're given. So the first thing we can think about here is the options that the firm has in setting their dividend policy. So there are a few of these. The first one is we could set a constant dividend. So we could set a constant dividend, i.e. the firm pays out the same amount every year. So we pay one million of a dividend and we pay that out every year without fail. Well, what we need to realize is that we're going to be paying a dividend and the market is going to make a decision based on that. When I talk about the market, I think about uh, investors, potential investors, analysts, and those interested in the financial markets. What do they like to see? They like to see a steady growing dividend. They'll want to see a dividend that keeps up with inflation and preferably outstrips inflation. So knowing that a constant dividend may not be suitable because if we have a constant dividend, well then that's not keeping up with inflation. So the market may not be happy with a constant dividend. Okay, then we could pay a constant proportion of earnings. So that means if earnings was going up, well, if we pay 50% of earnings, then our dividend is going to go up. However, as we said, the market likes to see a steady growing dividend. What if our earnings goes down? Well, that would mean that our dividend would go down. If our dividend goes down, the market's not going to be very happy with that. Our investors may not be happy with that either. So paying a constant proportion of earnings has its drawbacks as well. Although on the plus side, if we pay a constant proportion of earnings, we can always pay that dividend. We'd never have any problem paying it out. It could be that we decide to have an inflation linked dividend and that could fit in with our expectations from the market who want a constant growing dividend. If it's inflation linked, it's likely to go up. So it would therefore be that. However, inflation linked, it may be keeping up with inflation, but it's not outstripping inflation, which is ideally what we would like to do to be growing the wealth of our shareholders. So inflation linked has its downsides also. Or we could pay what's left after our investments. Don't forget that there are plenty of businesses out there that don't pay a dividend at all. For example, Apple for many years did not pay a dividend. Why not? Because they reinvested their earnings. And that is valid. As long as the investors within your business and the shareholders understand that that's what you're doing and you're able to grow the business by investing in new products, by selling more and by reinvesting that back into the business to grow the business even more. So we could simply pay out what's left after those investments or indeed nothing at all. And as long as we communicate with our investors to make them aware of what we're doing with the retained earnings that we have within the business, well then that should be okay. So we could pay what's left after we've made the required investments. So those are some of the options that we have, be able to discuss them and apply them and recognize them when you're looking at what a certain business has done in an exam scenario. Theories that we need to be aware of, well, dividend irrelevancy theory. This was put forward by Miller and Modigliani and we'll see quite a bit of Miller and Modigliani throughout this course. But they proposed this dividend irrelevancy theory, which was all about maximizing shareholder wealth. Remember we said to maximize shareholder wealth, we'll be looking at the share price growth and the dividend paid to see how much that shareholder wealth has increased by. So they fixed this theory around irrelevancy and said, well, you have a choice as a business when it comes to dividends. You can either pay a dividend, so you pay out a dividend to your shareholders. In that instance, the investors get their return. They get that return in the form of the dividend. Or you could reinvest the earnings. Rather than paying a dividend, you reinvest the earnings in the business like we suggested. 
And if we reinvest the earnings wisely, well, that means we'll make more profit. If we make more profit, the business will be more attractive to investors. That will mean that our shareholders, our share price will go up. So if our share price goes up, well, then our investors get a return because the shares that they currently hold will be worth more. So if we reinvest the earnings, that leads to share price growth. So, so far we've said we've got two choices. We can pay a dividend, in which case the investors get a return in the form of the dividend. Or we can reinvest the earnings in the business, make more profit, and that should lead to share price growth. And that is a return to our shareholders. So both of these maximise shareholder wealth. You either get the return through the dividend or the return through the increase in the share price. So both of them will give us the same return to the shareholders. Hence, Miller and Modigliani said, dividends are irrelevant. Doesn't matter whether we pay them or not, because either way, our investors get their return by the same amount. Now, there are some problems with dividend irrelevancy theory because Miller and Modigliani made some assumptions. They assumed, for example, rational investors. Well, the financial crisis since 2007 has proved that we do not have rational investors. So that is a bit of a strained assumption. They also assume no transaction costs when moving between different shares. We know that that's not the case. We know that we need to pay to make investments. So that wasn't an accurate assumption. But the most important assumption that they made was that there was no tax difference for your investors between getting a dividend and getting increase in the share price. But there will be. When an investor gets a dividend, they need to pay tax in the year that they receive that dividend. However, if the share price goes up, unless the investor sells that share, they won't have a capital gains tax liability. So there is a big tax difference between dividends and share price growth, which Miller and Modigliani ignored in their dividend irrelevancy theory. So that's a key drawback to it because investors may well choose their investment based on whether they are likely to get dividends paid to them or not. So some other theories that we need to be aware of. This one we've discussed inadvertently already, the signalling effect. And this is the signal that the market takes from your dividend. Remember we said the market likes to see steady growth in your dividend. Well, if you pay a reduced dividend, the market might think that you're in financial difficulties. Now, that may not be the case, as we now know. We may have a product we want to reinvest our earnings into. So we would need to make sure that we keep the market informed about that. And that will form part of your answer in such a situation. They could think if we pay no dividend that we're close to bankruptcy. But again, that may not necessarily be the case. That's simply the signal that the market is taking from your dividend. They may also assume that a business that's paying a rising dividend is a strong business. But again, that's a dangerous assumption because it could simply be that the business is paying a dividend out of retained earnings. So they may not have the profits to back that up. So the signaling effect is the signal that the market takes from your dividend and that needs to be considered when setting your dividend policy and is something that you need to discuss when uh, using this in an exam scenario. Another policy or another uh, theory that we have here is the bird in the hand argument. Very simply put, the bird in the hand argument states that investors want their return now. So they'd rather have the dividend paid now than the business to reinvest the earnings and try to increase the share price. The theory on that is that if they reinvest the earnings and don't do it wisely, the investors simply may not get, get a return ever. So they'll take the dividend now to avoid that risk. That's the bird in the hand argument that investors would rather take their return now. Lastly, the clientele effect. 
The clientele effect is really thinking about the tax preferences, etc., that we've already talked about. Some investors will have preferences for dividends to be paid. For example, if you were a pensioner, you may want to invest in shares that pay a dividend because you need to live off that revenue stream. If, for example, you were a younger investor who wants capital growth, well, then you may be more interested in businesses that reinvest their earnings seeking to achieve that capital growth. That may be based on tax preferences or it may simply be based on other investor preferences. The clientele effect says that a business should have a consistent policy when it comes to dividends so that your investors can make that decision. So they know that your business always pays a large dividend. Therefore, you attract the clientele that wants that dividend. Or you are a business that doesn't pay a dividend. You simply reinvest your earnings into the business. Again, you'll attract the clientele that want that policy. But what you shouldn't do is chop and change between having a dividend one year and no dividend the next, because then the investors can't make that decision. So the investors will choose based on the dividend that you pay, which business they want to invest in. So make sure that you can discuss all of these theories, particularly Miller and Medigliani's dividend irrelevancy theory, and also that you can apply this knowledge in a practical sense when it comes to a scenario-based question. Lastly, I want to consider non-cash dividends. So for example, a bonus or a script issue. A script dividend is where we pay out shares instead of cash. So when would this be appropriate? Well, it may be appropriate for a young growing business that simply doesn't have the cash flow to pay a dividend. So rather than paying out cash, they can pay shares instead of cash. And that will mean that investors get a return, they get more shares, but it preserves the cash flow of the business. Or you may find some businesses that undertake share repurchase schemes. So they'll repurchase their own shares. So they maybe have a cash pile. They reinvest it by buying their own shares and then cancelling those shares, thus decreasing the amount of equity in existence. So why might they do that? Well, there's various reasons. Uh, they may want to reduce the size of their equity. As we said, they're buying it back, then cancelling those shares. It will increase their earnings per share because remember, there'll be less shares. So that will increase the earnings per share. They may want to alter their gearing. And we'll look at this in more detail later on in this course. But by repurchasing their shares, that will reduce the amount of equity they have and will increase their gearing, which in some cases will be beneficial to the firm by lowering their weighted average cost of capital. Again, we'll look at that in more detail later on in this course. So share repurchases really are often seen as a way to use surplus cash. However, often uh, investors and the market see this as a bad sign because they would think, well, if you have surplus cash, have you run out of ideas as to what to do with that cash? Shouldn't you be reinvesting it in the business to generate more profit, to do whatever it is that business does to generate that profit rather than buying back your own shares? So it can sometimes be seen as a sign that management have run out of ideas. But do be aware that a share repurchase is a valid use of surplus cash. It can take place in various ways. You can simply buy back the shares on the stock market. You could go to institutional investors such as pension funds and insurance companies who have invested in your business and perhaps have large investments and buy them back from them. Or indeed, issue an offer to all shareholders to buy the shares back should they wish to do so. So that was our lecture on financial strategy. This sets the scene for the discussion based questions that you may have to undertake in the exam. You must know the linkage between investments, financing and dividend policy. 
You must know your three financial objectives and be able to discuss whether a firm has achieved them, also with reference to the stakeholders of that firm. And you must be able to discuss and apply dividend policy. These are core areas, they come up all the time, so you need to be able to deal with them.